too good to be true, it's... It is. Come on, if it sounds too good to be true, it's... It is. Not true. We make money the old-fashioned way. We work. Earn, it. earn it. There is no such thing as a free... Ride. Wow, everybody knew that one. <laughs> Turn your name and that's how we roll. <laughs> Where there is no... There, there, there is no gain without... God helps those who. How many of you know that's in the Bible? No, no it's not. It's, 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 you are awesome. You are awesome. If anyone ever understood the grace of God, it was the Apostle Paul. He started out the chief of sinners, ended up the chief of apostles. The only way he made the transition from the chief of sinners to the chief of apostles was one word, and that was grace. Someone once said that if you ever saw, if you ever see a turtle sitting on top of a fence post, he did not get there by himself. Amen. And if you stop and think about it, this is the definition of grace. If you ever see a saint of God sitting in church with his Bible open and their life straightened out, their addiction broken, their name written in the book of life, you know one thing, they didn't get there by themselves. If you ever see anybody singing in the choir with their hands raised up freely praising God, you can know one thing, they did not get there by themselves. And if you ever hear a preacher preach and God's really using him and anointed him, you can know one thing for sure, he didn't fall up to that pulpit by himself. God in his grace raised him up. And I'm thankful for the grace of God. It is what we've been given in Jesus. It's a grace package that will help us get to where we want to get or where we cannot get on our own. Somebody shout grace. Grace. There's a tendency to forget that in the church. There's a tendency to forget what John 16 says, what Jesus says, We have, you have not chosen me, but I've chosen you. Amen. 
Which means that when I walk up to this pulpit, I don't walk up here because I chose to do this. No, he chose me and he chose you. Therefore, it is a grace that makes effectiveness happen. Come on, come on, Every now and then someone needs to grab us by the shoulders and shake us and remind us that by grace we are saved, not by works. And we ought to be overwhelmed by it. We ought to get shook up about it. And we ought to get broken over it every now and then. It's, it's the grace of God. I said it's the grace of God. You've got to get this. Turn to someone and say you've got to follow the brother. You gotta get this. You gotta get this. The estimate, listen to this. The estimate of any object is determined by what a person is willing to pay for that object. Uh, let me say that again. The estimate of any object is determined by what a person is willing to pay for that object. And when God looked at us, Silver and gold was not enough to pay the price for you and me. He made, he said, our worth is more than silver and gold. The worth is that of my only son's blood being shed on the cross. And if you ever wonder if God loves you, Calvary is the only answer to that question. You have great worth to God. Turn to your neighbor and say, I have great worth to God. Turn to the person behind you and tell them, so get off my back. Give the Lord a praise, everybody. Give the Lord a praise, everybody. Give the Lord a praise. So you would go to Galatians 2.21, you would find where Paul says, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness Righteousness comes through the law that Christ died in vain. It's that grace that Paul said, I do not frustrate by entering into legalism. I do not frustrate by that grace by trying to, and I don't mean to get controversial, and yet I hear a lot of people talking about, we need to get back to, to, to the feast. We need to go back celebrating the stuff in the Old Testament. Now, I understand what they're saying. And there's great lessons and types and, and shadows of Christ that we can see there. But everything in that Old Testament, you need to understand it was written for our learning. But we don't need to go there because Christ has become our Passover. Hey, I don't have to eat a Passover meal. Jesus is my Passover. Listen, the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So Paul said, I don't frustrate the grace of God. Are you with me? Yeah. Now Paul makes this statement in Titus 2.12. He says this, the grace of God causes us to deny. Oh, you got to hear this. The grace of God causes us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. That we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. He said, grace teaches us. Grace is a teacher. So let's go to school. And he said, when grace really gets a hold of your life, you don't say I'm covered by grace and I can do anything I want to do and I don't fall and I don't fall out of grace. I, I fall into grace and, and it's okay because grace has got me covered. No, no. When real grace gets a hold of your life, it teaches you something. Listen to the words. It teaches us to deny ungodliness, to deny worldly lust, to deny or to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Turn to your neighbor and say, hey, that's grace. When nobody else is doing it, when nobody else is doing it, great grace teaches you to be different. And there are some things that I, that, that I don't do because Grace forbids me to do it. Nobody preaches about that anymore. Instead of adding to your to-do list, you need to add some things to your don't-do list. The Bible speaks of a the Bible speaks of a spirit of grace. The Bible speaks of great grace. The Bible speaks of grace and peace. The word speaks of abundant grace. Paul talked about sufficient grace. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 8. Concerning this thing, 
I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And verse 9 says, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient. Three times I said, God, get me out of this trial. And three times God said, my grace is sufficient for you. I will not remove it because I'm teaching you something. I'm allowing you to go through this darkness. There's treasures that are going to come out of this darkness. And when I teach you in darkness, Jesus said, you will proclaim in the night. See, so you're going through something and you don't understand. It's so dark that, that you almost want to give up. And, you're, and some of you here are on the brink of surrendering. And you're walking away from everything. But I've come to tell you that you have to understand that Jesus said, I'll talk to you in the darkness about things that you will proclaim in the light. Now, and the Lord came by Moses, but grace through Jesus Christ. That's right, man. John 8 there was a woman that was caught in the very act of adultery meaning that she was probably barely dressed she was dragged in humiliation and shame she was thrown down at the feet of Jesus and the Pharisees said Moses in the law Jesus commanded us that such should be stoned turn to somebody and say okay here we go Hear me. Hear me. The problem with judgmental people is that they always, they always, they don't know when to shut up. Now don't look at anybody, just you and me. When they hear something, they talk about it until their battery runs dead on their cell phone. Then they go home and pick up their phone and they talk about it until that phone has a nervous breakdown. They don't know when to shut up. Judgmental people talk too much. And if they would have just stopped right there, if these Pharisees would have just said, Moses' law said to stone her, they could have picked up rocks and would have been completely in line in stoning her. And I, and, and I propose Jesus would have watched it happen. But they talked too much when they turned and said, after they talked about the law of Moses for thousands of years that was enacted, that were under the law of Moses said the law said to stone her. But then they kept talking when they said, what do you say, Jesus? Come on. Come on. And at that moment, Jesus made the transition out of the law. The law came by Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And all of a sudden, he stepped in. Jesus steps in, and he looks at the woman. And he listened to the accusers. And he stepped, he stooped down. And he started to touch dirt. Stooped down. And he started to touch dirt. And maybe the reason he stooped down and started touching the dirt was he was sending a signal to that woman who felt so dirty. Jesus might have stooped down and Jesus might have been saying, I don't mind getting my hands dirty to rescue you. When you can't get to me, I stoop down. I touch dirty, messed up, shameful, filthy lives with my nail scar hands. I'm not so high and mighty and holy, Jesus said, that I can't get my hands dirty. Come on. Come on. Come on. That should have been enough. Come on. But then he stood up and he said, if you don't have any stones to throw, you're dismissed. And they all threw the rocks down and walked away. And there was, there was nobody left but Jesus. And he asked her, where are your accusers? And she said, there's none. And he said, that's right. Hallelujah. See, the only one that could have accused her because he was sinless didn't have any rocks in his pocket. And his name was Jesus. Yeah. And can I tell somebody something here tonight that thinks that God doesn't love you and that thinks that God doesn't care for you? I just want to tell you that God doesn't have any rocks in his pocket with your name on it. God so loves you. Oh, see, somebody ought to stand, somebody should stand up right there and say, thank you for your great talent. But this is what I've never seen before. Check this out. And it was as if, it was 
promises that Jesus thought she still doesn't get it. And that sounds like the church. There's a lot of people in church that still don't get unconditional love. There's a lot of people in church that don't still get, they don't understand the grace of God. And, and he says she still doesn't get it. See, because John tells us that Jesus stooped down again. Again, he stoops down again. He put his hands in the dirt. As if to say to that woman, I don't care how many times I have to stoop down and I don't care how many times I have to get my hands dirty. I don't care how many times you keep doing it over and over. And every time you do, I'm going to stoop down and I'm not afraid to get my hands dirty and I'm not afraid to touch the dirt in your life because I love you so much. I'll keep touching the dirt and get my hands dirty until I get you saved. Hey, give grace a chance. If you messed up again, Jesus said, don't worry. I'll get my hands dirty again. I'll get down in the dirt again. As often as I have to. The way we just give up on people. The way we just give up on people. The way we just walk away from people. We get frustrated with people like drug addicts and alcoholics. We wipe our hands clean of them. I'm tired. I did everything I could. I, I got you in a nine-month program and you still can't get your act together. And we, we wipe our hands. But not Jesus. Oh, you're down again? Oh, you're high again? Oh, you're drunk again? Oh, you messed up again? Well, let me stoop down again. And let me touch you again. And let me get my hands dirty again. And again. And again. And again. I'm talking to you about grace. See, Jesus can do it. Sometimes we get so used to being clean. We've been clean so long that we don't feel like it's our calling to get our hands dirty with messed up people anymore. Uh, don't look at me with that tone of voice. Yeah, I'm so clean. I'm so holy. And the truth is, all of righteousness is as filthy rags. If Jesus could get his hands dirty to rescue people, who are we to kick him to the curb? The preacher in Texas that had a a high cl a, a class call girl coming to his church. She was a Buddhist and her husband was running from the FBI. She was struck out on drugs. He said that when she was ready to walk down the aisle to give her life to the Lord, the preacher said to her, Jesus is going to touch you and cleanse you. And he said that her response was, I'm the worst he's ever touched. And his quick response from the Holy Spirit was, he's the best you've ever had. When God's grace meets hell's worst, guess who's going to win? When God's grace meets hell's worst, guess who's going to win? Grace! Grace! Oh, grace! We'll always win. God. Listen, the preacher said that she was Buddhist. They had Buddhist statues everywhere with some snake trees with all kinds of emblems and idols. And he said that she called them one day and said that she had been reading her Bible after he baptized her and she came out of the water. She said, this is the cleanest I've ever felt. But listen to this. She called her pastor up and said, Pastor, I want you to come over because I read in my Bible that when Joshua got to where he had or was supposed to be, Joshua said, I'm going to tear down the idols in my father's house. And so she said, these idols of Buddha all over my porch, my house, and my yard. Come on over, Pastor. Let's have ourselves a Buddha bashing. I, I, I'm, ju I'm just reading the story. I didn't tell you. I'm not telling you. But... Preach it. Come on, Pastor. And I'm saying this to, to you tonight. What I'm saying is 
give grace a chance. The preacher said that he got himself a baseball bat and he said, I felt like, 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 like Buford Purser. I don't know if you guys ever saw Walking Tall. He said, I started bashing Buddhas all over that house and it was the most fun I've ever had in my life. I'm the worst he's ever touched, she said. But I've never felt this clean. What is this preacher? What is this pastor? I feel so clean. And he said, it's grace. It's the grace of God. And if we ever get to that place that we understand the grace of God, the grace of God will set you free tonight. It will set you free. All I'm saying this, uh, 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 this uh, evening to you is give it a chance. All I'm saying is to stoop down. Don't be afraid to get your hands dirty in somebody else's life. Amen. Maybe, there's, maybe there's somebody in your life, somebody in your workplace, maybe there's somebody you're connected to that needs some grace right about now. And you feel as if you don't know what to really do, but, but, but just keep reaching down. Just keep getting your hands dirty. If you'll give grace a chance, some of you are looking at me as if you don't know what I'm preaching about. Come on. Do you remember? I'll tell you what I'm preaching about. Come on, Pastor. Do you remember where you were before grace found you? Or she got quiet in this Pentecostal church. Do you remember where you were before grace found you? That's what I'm preaching about. Somebody had to get their hands dirty for you. Somebody had to keep reaching down for you in your marriages. You keep reaching down for people. Well, you know, you know, they came and they backslid and here they are again. Good. Stoop down one more time. Get your hands in that dirt one more time. And if they mess up again, go out after them and love them even more and stoop down one more time. The Bible said Jesus stooped down again. Grace is the face that God puts on when he looks at my failures and at my faults Amen. and at my flaws. There was a man after God's own heart by the name of David. Listen to this. When it says that he was a man after God's own heart, that means that he chased God. He stayed after God. He chased God. And I believe I, believe I know where he caught God. See if you agree. He was sitting on the throne of Israel, David was, as their king. He had all power. And one day he's sitting there and he's thinking about the man who's chased him for 10 years. His name was Saul. His name was Saul and he was, he was trying to kill David. And David said in 2 Samuel 9, 1, he said this. Is there anyone left alive of the house of Saul, the guy that's been trying to kill him for 10 years, of the house of Saul that I may show my kindness to? Do you, do you want to know when you're pure? When you could, but you don't. Go ahead, Pastor. Preach. ain't going to say nothing. I will. You want to know when you're pure? When you could, but you don't. When you could wipe somebody out. You want to know when you're real? It's when you know that they've done wrong and you know you haven't and you could clean their clock, but you don't. That's when you know that you're pure. David is in a position of power. Mephibosheth, the only lasting seed of King Saul, the Gibeonites had killed all his sons. And there was only one grandson connected by the name of Mephibosheth. Try to say that ten times as fast as you can. He was lame, hear me now. He was lame and crippled. He was deprived and his clothes were torn and tattered and he was unkept. He was filthy. He was unattractive and besides that, he was weak, puny, and he was pitiful. 
And David, when he heard about this crippled grandson of his enemy, David said, bring him to my palace. Clothe him with my best. Bring him to my table. Now you've got to understand the table of David. David had a son named Absalom. The Bible says Absalom was very common, which is a word that means extremely handsome like this. <laughs> All right, hey. be that way. <laughs> the scripture says that he had long, wavy hair. He ended up being hung on a tree, if you remember, because he got caught in the tree limb. He was like Fabio. He, he, he was cut. He had long hair. The guy was handsome. He had some hard features. He looked like a movie star. He was sitting at the table. Perfect physical features. Amen. Sitting across the table was Tamar, David's daughter. And she was very, very beautiful. So much so that tragically one of her half-brothers raped her because of her unusual beauty. These are people sitting at David's table. Follow me. Sitting at the same table was another son by the name of Solomon. He was the wisest, the sharpest, he was the smartest. Made the right choices, did the right things. And the Bible says that he had such supernatural wisdom that if you asked him anything, he would tell you the answer in a minute. The wisest man that ever lived, Solomon, was sitting at that table. So now you got David sitting at the end. You got pretty boy on the other side. You got the model girl on the other side. And you've got old Mr. Brain, smart as a whip, valedictorian of his class, Solomon, sitting on the other side. And then walks in. Dragging his feet. In walks in with a feeble chair. Limping. On homemade crutches. Filthy. Dirty. Not much hygiene. Here he comes. And David said, Mephibosheth, yes, my king, sit at my table. Sit at my table continually. Never again will you be out there. You belong here, Mephibosheth. Come and sit at my table. The son of his enemy. Grace. And I believe that when David was doing that, God was saying, oh, yeah. He's been chasing me. And when he put Mephibosheth on that table, he caught me. He caught my heart. He's stooping down and getting his hands dirty. And I never I, I never read where Mephibosheth got healed or lame of, of his lameness. You know, you 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 caught you know that you caught God's heart when you keep working with someone who never seems to measure up. And there's no proof that he ever got his legs of faith. We walk by faith. There's no proof the boy ever got it together. But David said, you still come. Come and eat at my table. And I'm going to keep feeding you. And I'm going to keep glow, uh, uh, clothing you. And I'm going to keep getting dirty for you. I'm going to keep stooping down for you. And that, that's the heart of our father. That's the heart of our Father. And He says to whoever's here tonight, I don't care what your secret is. I don't care about your past. I don't care about the mess, the shame, the hurt, or what sin has done to you. All I care about is that you understand my grace. So I've got some good-looking ones in here. They're, they're looking pretty good. I thought I was going to beat you. I was doing good. I thought I was going to get a hold of my head of her. Shop local said, You know that song I sing, Princess?
and some tremendous wisdom and I'm so grateful to be here but I'm so grateful for the grace of God I didn't even graduate from high school I didn't finish high school I don't deserve to be speaking at a great church like Living Word tonight and sometimes I think about it and I still can't believe it I was a loser in school. I was an alcoholic and a drug addict at a very young age. I was a very violent gang member. But look at what the grace of God has done. And if he did it for me, he'll do it for you. And grace brought me out. And he got dirty for me. Grace will bring you out. And he'll get dirty for you. Stop it. And I messed up. We've 
all messed up. When God says, I'm ready to stoop down. I'm ready to get dirty. I'm ready to do it one more time for you. One more time for you. I'm ready to do it. We're changing the order of the service. We're opening the altar up. Come. We have these great men and women of faith that want to pray with you right now. Come down. Come church. Come church. There's so much grace in this house. So much grace. Hallelujah. I sing praises to your name.
give the Lord a hand tonight. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Come on, give the Lord a good praise. Hallelujah. What an awesome word. Thank you, Pastor Charlie. Come on, man. we had a great time. The presence of the Lord is in this place. Amen. We'll go ahead and be seated. We're not dismissed. Give us a couple of